Hey everybody, welcome to TGIK episode number 120. Good to see you all out there. <clears throat> Hope everything's going well. Let's see how everybody's doing in our chat. We got a few people, some who signed in pretty early today. We got some folks from, uh, we got Pratik saying hello from India. Good to see you. And we have Paul saying hello back from California. Lamati checking in. Good to see you, Mr. Lamati. We got <coughs> David Michael saying hello, TGIK. Good to see you, David Michael. And Rory and Liam <coughs> from the UK. We got Sevi from Istanbul. We got Mr. Josh Rosso checking in. And Lachman is going to be joining us again. I hope that we'll also see Rita today because we're going to be exploring um, some of the work again that they did. So, so it's two episodes kind of back to back where we're going to be talking about some, some of the amazing work that those, that those folks have been working on, which will be awesome. Um, we got Mart Martin checking in. We got Hari from Rotterdam. We got Anish saying hello. And Jeremy Pruitt. This is uh, somebody I used to work with at um, Juniper way back in the day. It's good to see you, Jeremy. Uh, Sebastian from Hungary, Yuka from Helsinki, and Ansel from saying hello, good to see you all. And Simone from uh, Italy, I don't know actually how to say that in Italian, but I'll just say hello, good to see you. Scotty Ray from Mr. Pens from Pensacola, Florida. <coughs> Scotty's one of the people that has actually ridden a motorcycle, I think, all the way across the country and back a couple times. So it's like, shout out for that, like that's, that's an intense ride. Rita has joined us, that's awesome. We got... Uh, Batuhan from Turkey and Kundinya, Kundinya from DC and Olaf saying hello. We got Mr. Pedro Costa from Scotland and Christian from Germany. All right, we got lots of people joining us today from all over the world once again. Awesome to see you all. We got Jason uh, joining us from HashiCorp. That'll be tremendous. And Jim, good to see you. Um, and and in, this, in this session, where I'm going to be basically walking through some of the documentation on how to use. Uh, um, secret store for vault on kind instead of on minikube so in their documentation they present this on minikube we're going to be exploring it with kind because you know how i roll about that kind of stuff but we'll also be digging in a little bit and seeing kind of how the pieces work and what are some of the differences in the way that it the way, in the way that it works i am in the backyard again you're absolutely right um you know it's great to be out it's great to be outdoors but also like my home is not really set up as an office space, and so <laughs> it's like I look for pretty much any excuse to get the heck out of the house. Uh, yes, and thank you again. Thank you again for all of your, uh, for all of the folks who contribute upstream, whether docs or, or, um, or applications or any of that stuff. It's it really is, uh, it really is tremendous. Let's click over to screen and face. This week's notes, as usual, are up at tgik.io notes, and so feel free to jump in there if you have links that you want to share or anything else, any other content. Um, also, this is going to be where we're keeping notes for the show. Let's go ahead and dig into this week's news. So in core Kates, or core Kubernetes, I should say, things are quite upstream with the elongated release cycle, so things have actually been, um, so like, you know, some of the things, uh, some of the release cycle has been changed time-wise. Um, there was a note on this in the dev uh, mailing list, but I don't remember exactly what the detail was. So if you're curious about that, maybe uh, maybe George can put up a link to that. Sasha Gunhart has done a data analysis on PRs and issues in Kubernetes. Let's check that out. That'll be kind of interesting. So this is hosted on the Kubernetes blog. And uh, George told me about this one, but I didn't get a chance to check it out. So I'm actually kind of curious. So this is the story of data sciencing, 90,000 GitHub issues, pull requests using Kubeflow, TensorFlow, Prow, and a fully automated CI CD pipeline. Fascinating. Choosing the right steps when working, getting the data, got raw data from the GitHub API. I'm sure they were like probably trying to throttle you too. REST API exported roughly 91,000 issues and pull requests in the first iteration into a massive 650 megabyte data blob. That is a huge amount of data. This took, I mean, it's not a huge amount of data when you think about it, like it's just 650 megabytes, but um, but think about the content, right? We're just talking about little pieces of text, <laughs> which, which are not a megabyte, I promise you. So like, really, that is a lot of data. That's a lot of text, structured or not. This is uh, this took me about eight hours of data retrieval time because GitHub rate limited me. That makes sense. 
kick it into what's happening here, which is a, some good detail into what's happening to get the data set built. Mr. Joe Beta gets a call out here, created the first GitHub issue mentioning that the unit test coverage was too low. The issue has no further description other than the title and no enhanced labeling applied. Like we know from more recent issues in pull requests, but now we have to explore the exported data more to do something interesting. So some of the structured data wasn't structured in a consistent way. And exploring the data, I guess this is actually the number of issues over time. This is, that's pretty cool. Analyzing created versus closed. It's a pretty fascinating graph. Creating closed for creating versus closed PRs over time. A lot of PRs are languishing there. You can kind of see that right out. Let's jump. That jumps right out at you. Labels, labels, labels. I'd love to see this one over time too, because in reality, I think that label stuff is relatively new in the life cycle of the project. It's not. It certainly isn't everywhere. Label usage by name for PRs. Lots of LGTMs. That makes sense. Lots of CNCIF CLAs, which are the, you know, there's a bot on the GitHub repository to ensure that you have um, signed off on the license agreement. Neat. It's probably release note done, but whatever. Lots of approval. Lots of sizing. This is pretty cool. This is all just basically bot. Most of these are bot labels. Yeah, so if you're interested in this, this is actually a pretty fascinating thing, um, but feel free to dig more into that as well. Someone asked, why is everyone moving to operators? I don't really want to get into the Reddit article so much, but I am interested in this um, comment on it was from a gentleman named Matt Butcher, who's a principal software engineer. And <clears throat> in this article, I think he tries to, uh, he tries to tackle a, a concept or a challenge that he sees with people asking uh, a question around like operators versus Helm 3 and uh, you know like TGIK is a is, is a thing where we try to like provide some clarity around some of the projects that are out there and what's happening inside the space and I think this is a really good article that does such, that tries to do exactly that right um, Helm and op and the operator pattern are uh, really do solve two very distinctly different problems um, and because of that, I don't think that there's necessarily a battle between the two. I think of them as solving two distinct problems, right? Operators are meant to be, um, are meant to have a reconciliation loop that will follow over time and, and give you the ability to codify things like operational knowledge about how to operate particular applications or um, stateful applications over time. And their responsibility is to watch those applications for health and understand how to fix it when things break. Um, whereas Helm is a package manager, right? It's the goal is to actually provide you a tool that allows you to uh, install things. And we're going to be using Helm today when we start playing with the, with the secret store operator stuff. But, you, um, but when Helm installs a thing, it installs that thing and it records what it did, of course, but it, it doesn't stay around um, and, and, uh, and reconcile the state of that installed thing over time. It hands that off. Right, that's the job now of your, of your target environment. Kubernetes is responsible for managing that stuff over time, but it's but yeah, and for me that's the distinct difference between these two things. Right, this is where, this is where that we, um, where I think the 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 difference is really succinct. You know, operators have a different are trying to solve a different problem. Um, so great article, by Mr. Matt Butcher. Definitely check that out. Um, let me know what you think in the comments. Cloud Native Ecosystem, there is a Cloud Native party happening on 2 June. I know that we all need a little party sometime, and, uh, you know, it's definitely been a while since we were, you know, a bunch of us were able to get to meet in person. So if you have some time on the 2nd of June, uh, they're really trying to make sure that you have the opportunity to come and be a part of this. So look at the time frame, right? So Pacific time is 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. Hopefully somewhere in that cycle, Anywhere, wherever you are in the world, you will find maybe a little bit of time to jump in and like catch a session or maybe hit the hallway track and say hello. My good friend, <coughs> Stephen Augustus is going to be um, emceeing this along with some other folks and the, and the, and the, and the presenters look tremendous. 
So um, Stephen and Cheryl are going to be emceeing this, and then we have quite a few other speakers, right? We have folks from different companies talking about different tooling that they're building. There's just a lot of uh, a lot of really good content on here with a lot of really amazing folks. So definitely check this one out. This is actually a project I find fascinating. Crustlet, a web assembly Kubernetes kubelet in Rust, which is fascinating. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, definitely check out uh, Mr. Ralph Squillis' talk. That'll be really a good one. And then this one, uh, this is the last par part I'm gonna call out on the, on the list here. If you have a chance to check this one out, I definitely recommend it. Jeffrey's a great speaker, and uh, Jeff actually hosted a CTF, or Capture the Flag, on, um, on Kubernetes that he hosted, and it was something of a, uh, just kind of an open competition. People who are interested in chasing that stuff down, uh, in trying out uh, to challenge the security of Kubernetes, were able to join that CTF uh, for free and try to uh, take over the cluster. And he, he definitely formed it after the idea of um, the Goose Game. Uh, and so it was really kind of a fun nod to both Capture the Flag, which is a great way to learn uh, more about a thing that you probably didn't already know, and um, just, a, you know, a shout out to the Goose Game, which was really super fun. So check those out. It's open all day. It's open for tw uh, 12 hours in that day. I hope that you'll have some time to join. It's a free registration. Um, it should be a good time. So webinars this week, we got an Octant webinar on June 3rd. That'll be the day after this Cloud Native Party thing. We got Cluster API webinar coming up on June 11th. That should be a really exciting one. Um, uh, myself and Spencer Crum just recorded one yesterday on OBS streaming. And in that session, I talked a lot about how we go about doing this on TGIK. And so if you're interested in understanding or exploring some of the OBS stuff that we talk about in that session, definitely click the link. Why is Kubernetes getting more so popular? This is a webinar talking about Kubernetes stuff. So Kubernetes is si about six years old. Most of infrastructure is YAML, so basically adds code, extensibility. I think we talked about a lot of these things in previous episodes, but if you're interested in joining that conversation, definitely check out the webinar. I'm shooting through this stuff because I'm trying to get to the show notes. All right. So show notes. Here we go. Using CSI store to enable ingress controller with TLS. Well, that'll be interesting. All right, so how are we doing in the chat? Everybody saying hello. We got some folks from Dusseldorf. We got ABC123 saying hello. We got Mozifer from Mozifer from uh, saying hello as well. And Mr. Craig Peters saying hey. Sabrata from Virginia and my friend Joe from West Virginia. I thought, have you always been in West Virginia, Joe? I thought you were like in the city. Um, we got Z saying hello, and the Suresh saying uh, hello from Hamburg. Good to see you, Suresh. A meme for plus one. Oh, that would be amazing. Uh, I don't know enough about WebAssembly to actually tackle that one, but that would be a really good one. A really good, uh, a really good one for sure. Sanjay saying hello from Basel, Switzerland, and gay. And I'm not going to try to slaughter your name. Uh, from Phoenix, Arizona. Good to see you, Mr. Hay. Or um, <coughs> and Paul Bauer saying hello from Australia. Good to see you. And AJ saying hello from San Jose, and Morteza saying hello from Tehran. Always been in West Virginia since we worked together, but only 90 minutes from D.C. Wow, okay. I thought, yeah. I thought for some reason you were closer to um, San Francisco, but I think that's just because I run into you sometimes. All right. Let me find my water cup, which is on the floor, and then let's get into it. Okie doke. So I wanted to go into um, kind of like what CSI is. Uh, so CSI, in its definition, is a container storage interface. And the idea of CSI, which I which I think is pretty, um, which is pretty big scope, but pretty awesome scope, right? Is to provide an interface to improve uh, not only the security of how we attach volumes and those sorts of things to um, to containers or pods inside of Kubernetes, but also to provide um, a little bit more flexibility in the model that that uses, right? So traditionally, um, inside of a, a, a stock Kubernetes cluster, when we, oh, close that, all right, there we go. And then I'll make this a little bigger. 
create cluster. So when we create um, a, a, just a stock, bog stock Kubernetes cluster, and we create a volume that we're going to mount with it, um, the, the traditional path for that is that the, the kubelet will, um, at whatever storage provider you're using, and these could be uh, storage classes or a dynamic provisioner or any of these things inside of um, Kubernetes. And kind actually comes with a default storage provider. So let's just take a look at that real quick. Get pods dash n local path storage. Waiting for those things to register. But um, there is a dynamic storage provider in Kubernetes already, or sorry, within kind already. And I kind of got into this in a recent post on MauiLion.dev. And so if you're interested in understanding more about um, storage options in uh, Kind, you can actually check out these top two articles. Uh, kind Persistent Volumes gets into it, and, we, and, I, and I break down the default storage class that's provided within Kind um, inside of that article. So you can go to MauiLion.dev, and that's where you'll find this article if that's something you're interested in. But suffice to say, we're going to wait for this to happen. Okay, there we go. Get on get pods dash a. Cool. Get on apply dash f. Before the CSI stuff happened, what we're looking at here was, was still happening, right? So all of this is not related to CSI at all. This is actually just following kind of the existing pattern within Kubernetes for volumes, in which you would have a dynamic storage provisioner, either in tree, provided by maybe the controller manager or some mechanism like that, or out of tree, um, wherein you have to define that external, uh, that storage provisioner. And that might be defined by your cloud integration provider. So. If you are hosting your Kubernetes cluster in AWS and you've turned on the cloud integration provider for AWS, then you will probably already have a storage class, a default storage class provided. And when you create a new persistent volume, that persistent volume will be will be taken from uh, EBS volumes inside of um, your particular AWS account, right? And that's kind of one of the mechanisms that, uh, and, and the way that that works. Um, and this is sort of like what came before CSI. This is what I'm digging into here, right? And so I kind of wanted to show you like how, how this was wired up on a, on a node level before we start getting into like what CSI is doing and how it works. So let's jump into our node here. And if we do uh, Sierra Kettle PS, now uh, a little tip here. Um, in kind, we use container D inside of the kind node. And so I have to use CRI kettle commands to actually interact with those with those things that are running inside of our environment, right? Uh, and so that's why you'll see me running the CRI kettle commands. So we should be able to see our kettle get pods. So wide. Okay. So then we should be able to see our container running here. So we should be able to see our kettle PS and grab test. Fascinating, right? What's happening there? Why would I not be able to see this happening? It'll get pods so wide. There it is running. It's on kind control plane. I'm executing into that control plane. CRI kettle. Yes. Neat. Oh, it's called name. Sorry, that's where I was messed up. So CRI kettle pods. Yes. Okay. So, uh, for some reason, whatever the reason, I actually named the container that's running um, uh, name, which is a terrible name for anything. So, <laughs> it's like there. So this is our container here. And so, just like with Docker, we can do inspect, right? And we can look at the um, container or the pod, but let's start with our container, and then we'll go look at our pod. 
And the way this stuff maps up when you attach a volume to a um, to a when you attach a volume to a container is that we're going to see uh, that we're going to see that volume showed up. I mean, uh, displayed when we look at the uh, the the pod in specific. So here is our PVC. So this is the actual attachment point for our um, for our volume that we created. And one of the interesting things that's happening here is that the uh, that what this means is that the way that um, Cubelet handles this particular attach is that it attaches this directly to the node and then presents that volume as an attachment to the pod. Okay, that means that the cubelet is going to be able to see all of those volumes attached and the pod is only going to be able to see those pods that are expressed to that pod. Does that make sense? Right now I only have just the one, uh, one pod, uh, one node to keep things simple and, and somewhat clear, I hope. So what I want to point that, so what, the reason I'm pointing that out is because I want to make sure that we understand that on the underlying host, right, um, touch this. On the underlying host, if we're manipulating the content on the underlying host, we'll be able to see that content manipulated in the, um, in the container. PVC. So there's our this file, right? So now on the underlying host, inside of the node, SSH'd into the node, I put this file called this, and when I connected to the container, I saw that show up. And that means that the, um, that the host has read-write access to all the volumes that the container has, and that that's actually how the attachment is happening. Now the reason I'm giving this background a little bit is because I wanted to actually, uh, uh, this is one of the areas where I think CSI really shows up, right? And that instead of actually um, handling it in this way explicitly, we could actually handle this in a different way, right? We could make it so that we're actually expressing a particular a volume attachment directly to the running container rather than directly to the underlying host and then mounting it in. How does Kubernetes node to schedule the pod on the node where the local volume is? That's a great question. I actually covered that in the article a little bit, but in this case, we actually have that running. So let's take a look at that real quick. This is kind of a sideline, but why not? So, sorry, I meant to say, look at the PV. So whenever you're creating a persistent volume, get PV. Whenever you're creating a persistent volume uh, claim and you're using that uh, storage, the dynamic storage provisioner model, you actually end up creating a PV, a persistent volume, and then making a persistent volume claim that is going to consume it. So in our case, when we created this deployment, we also defined a persistent volume claim, and that persistent volume claim triggered the storage provider to say, make a new directory and associate that directory as a local storage connector um, with a particular persistent volume. And if we look at the persistent volume, we can see some pretty interesting information, right? We can see that the person who created the claim against this persistent volume, or the entity that created this uh, claim against this persistent volume is actually um, inside of the namespace default. And the persistent, claim, persistent volume claim is, the, is named test. But down below is actually where we get into the answer of the question for Bogdan, right? this node affinity piece. This becomes a scheduling predicate for anything that's going to attach to this volume. So when you define a pod that is going to attach to this, to this particular persistent volume, then node affinity kicks in. And before we can schedule that pod, we have to determine that the pod can be scheduled in the same place that the, that the volume is located. And that's actually how that part of the magic works, right? And so in our case, we're actually keying on host name. But in, if you were using AWS, for example, you instead might be keying on, partic on a particular availability zone because storage doesn't traverse uh, uh, availability zones. Storage remains within the availability zone in which it was created, right? And so in this way, we can actually express node affinity with a persistent volume to ensure that when we're selecting the node or determining what nodes to consider, 
we are only considering nodes that have access to that particular volume. And yes, Muzaffar, you are correct. Uh, the actual mounting is happening at the host and not in the container, exactly. But that might be different with CSI, and that's actually where I think CSI gets pretty interesting. All right, I know that I've been throwing a lot of data at you. I hope that this is, uh, this is going pretty well. Um, but I think this is kind of important stuff. So this is sort of it's what we've talked about so far entirely. Everything that we've talked about has nothing at all to do with CSI. Everything that we talked about right now is kind of like the way things are inside of Kubernetes before CSI. And now CSI can actually um, do a few different things. I'm realizing that I'm waving at the chat rather than waving at the camera, but you get the idea. All right, so cool. Let me do kind delete cluster. I'm going to create a kind, cat kind YAML. I don't need that many workers. So I'm going to make a single master two worker cluster and we're going to work through the rest of our content and that's inside of that cluster. So let's go back to our notes here and talk a little bit more about what's happening here. First, I want to kind of like talk through the introduction and then we'll get into a bit more. So CSI's goal is to, is, is to provide a standard for exposing arbitrary block and file storage systems to containerized workloads in uh, inside of things that are maybe not just Kubernetes, but like, you know, just like CNI can be used across different things. CSI is also trying to, uh, to be that sort of a spec to things, right? It wants to basically just provide sort of a generic interface that you can use whenever you're dealing with containers. Kubernetes obviously does, and so it's a great consumer of that. Um, it's been around a while. It went GA and V113. Uh, there's some great content in here if you're interested in understanding more about kind of the history. Um, it gets into the design doc, some of the recommended mechanisms. If you want to develop a CSI driver for Kubernetes, if this is something that is uh, on your you know, bucket list, then this is a great place to start. Um, it's got a lot of really good documentation for, you know, what all of the different components of a CSI driver might look like. <coughs> and, excuse me, and kind of the format of, uh, of, of this sort of stuff, right? So it's going to get into the different sidecar containers that are used. It's going to get into the different deployment models. Um, and then the CSI specific objects. Um, one of the features that um, are expressed by the CSI piece that so is kind of built into the spec here is the idea of being able of, of being able to solve uh, secrets in a different way, right? So the CSI driver for secrets <coughs> is here, and we have and, and it kind of gets into how it's working and what and what kind of things we can do here, right? So. This is actually a generic implementation that allows the CSI mechanism to provide a way to attach or inject secrets into a container that is meant to increase the security of it, right? To basically improve the security model for handling secrets. And they call that out in their, in their documentation, right? Like this, we are handling sensitive in information. CSI drivers that accept secrets should handle this data carefully and may contain sensitive information. So they're really, um, they're really focused on the idea that like this stuff has to actually be pretty reasonable, pretty reasonably implemented, because everybody that sees a secret is a potential um, attack vector for things that are trying to get a hold of those secrets. And so we got to be really careful about how those things are implemented. Local path provisioner and flex volume are not quite the same thing. Yeah, CSI is a new iteration of flex volume. So getting into storage class secrets, um, the sidecar facilities, the handling of secrets following operations, we're gonna be able to handle, so if you're going to implement um, a provider for, a store, for this type of storage class, these are some of the operations that you'll have to satisfy. So if we're gonna use Vault, like we're going to in, in this session, the Vault um, secret provider will have to actually be able to, 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 be able to satisfy these particular calls. 
create a volume request, delete volume request, controller publish volume request, controller unpublish volume request, and we could get into these things, but we're not going to in this particular session. Instead, we're going to kind of like tear it apart and see what it looks like inside. But you know, but an example of basic provisioning of a, a basic provisioning of a secret. So here is a storage class example. In which the parameters are the fast provision storage key. So, and in this example, the external provision provisioner will fetch Kubernetes secret object, fast storage provisioner key in the namespace PD SSD credentials and pass the credentials to the CSI driver named CSI driver .team .example .com in the create volume CSI call. So in this way, we can actually map a particular secret from some other entity back to the mount call that a particular volume is going to have. All volumes provisioned with this storage class will get the same secret. So this is kind of like a one-to-many thing. Here's where you find the secret, and then whenever you try and actually access this particular storage class by name, you're going to get that secret. And this gives you the ability to kind of rotate those secrets dynamically and all of that good stuff. Per volume secrets, in this example, the external provisioner will generate the name of a Kubernetes secret object and namespace for node published volume. The CSI call based on the PVC namespace and annotations at per volume provision name. Now this is neat because it's a two-way communication, right? When we're defining the PVC claim, we're actually providing a hint to the uh, storage provider telling it where to find our secret and what and what parameters are necessary to understand about that secret so that when the um, the provider gets the call, right, it understands where to go and, and actually find that secret to present back. Uh, the first one was not dynamic. The first one was, here is where the secret is. If anybody calls this particular storage class, give them this secret. And the second one, which is per volume secrets, means when I ask for a volume, I'm going to give you some hint, some context about what secret I want. And I want you to be able to go and get that specific secret and bring it back to me in a secure way. That's a very cool difference thing, cool difference between the two. And then down below here, we have multiple operation secrets. A driver may support secret keys for multiple operations. In this case, you can provide secrets references for each operation. So here's the provisioner secret name and the namespace. The you're, we are relating the node published secret name and namespace. This is the secret that it's actually related to, and I guess it's going to be both. It's a combination of the first two examples. I believe that's right. So in this case, we're saying that like maybe we want uh, uh, that static secret to show up no matter what, but we also want to be able to determine what other secret you want dynamically, so we can kind of do both, which is pretty cool. Here's the create call, create delete volume secret, controller publish unpublish secret. They have the idea for staging secrets, which is actually pretty cool. Well, Lachlan, let me know if, you, if there's something in here that you would like me to cover a little bit more. And then node stage secret, which is the ability to stage secrets like we talked about before. A volume snapshot secret, what is that gonna do? Container facilities handling secrets for the following operations. So you can take a snapshot of a secret. Clusters can populate secret fields for the population listed with, the, with data from the Kubernetes secret objects for specifying these key keys in the volume snapshot class object. Why though? Oh, interesting. So if you have an external snapshotter and that snapshotter needs a credential, like maybe you're going to back something up to an S3 bucket, how do we get the credential to that snapshotter such that uh, it can use it to um, authenticate to the place where it's going to put the snapshot? Might be, a, it might be, I mean, I think I'm reading that right, but I think that's actually where they're headed with it and that's pretty cool. There is some topology piece built into this. We got raw block volume attach. CSI doesn't provide capability for querying block volume, so COs will simply pass through requests for block volume creation to CSI plugins. And plugins are allowed to fail with invalid argument if they don't support block volumes. 
Kubernetes doesn't make any assumptions about CSI plugins supporting blocks and which don't, of course. So this is actually kind of highlighting another, another challenge that we have. One of the questions that might have popped into your head when we were talking about the way that um, things work inside of Kubernetes today is why they work that way. Why we um, why the volume is mounted on the underlying host and then expressed to the container using Docker um, mount commands. And part of that is that uh, part I think part of that is probably historical, right? Because for a long time. You, that was pretty much the only way that you could express a volume to Docker. And the other part of it is that uh, Docker doesn't isn't going to handle things like, you know, ensuring that there's a file system on a block device. You can only express mount points to, you can only express uh, th specific things to Docker when it comes to attaching a particular volume or a particular device to a Docker container. You can't just say, here is a device and the Docker container will format it for you and put XTFS on there and make it all happy and then and then start up, right? That's not that's not that's kind of out of scope for Docker itself. And so instead, um, oh, welcome, Steve. Instead, what uh, that's actually kind of handed out to the CSI the CSI mechanism or your dynamic storage provisioner, right? So, for example, in the AWS EBS case, right, when I have created a persistent volume claim. The call goes up to AWS and says, make me an EBS volume. And the a AWS creates the ABS volume. And then we determine where um, we determine where the pod will be scheduled based on fault domain or availability zone. We schedule the pod there. We And then Kubelet makes a call to actually mount that volume onto that specific node <coughs> and ensures that, and in that process, we have to make sure that there is a file system on that EBS volume, and then we express that volume up to the, the pod when it starts up. <clears throat> and this will be true for like a number of different providers as well. Right, so if you were using, um, if you were using Minio, or if you were using, you know, any of the many, many, many solutions out there, Rook, there's a ton of them, right? I mean, if we actually, we can actually see what they are real quick. If we go to docs.case.io, storage volumes. Now, this is actually kind of a, a pretty reasonable list of, of those types of volume that you can actually associate with a pod, right? So all of the, many of these things are associated with projects that are, pro that are other upstream projects or other ways to attach. And so each of these things, as we see them, has to have a file system on it before we can actually express it to our pod. And that's actually kind of why we did it, why it was done before, right? Like something had to handle that action of putting a file system on it before attaching it to the pod. And typically that would happen right there, right before actually attaching it. Where did my, nope. Okay, um, but this actually explicitly calls out in the spec here that like this is something that we can handle with CSI, right? So when you're implementing that CSI driver, one of the ways that you, one of the things that you can do is make sure that uh, a volume that is being attached has a file system on it, and and you can handle all of that as as part of your implementation. Pod info and mount, volume expansion, being able to change things. There's also a lot of built-in stuff around snapshots and restore, which is really cool. Ephemeral lo local volumes, which I think was relatively new a while ago. I haven't looked at this one in a bit, but this gives you the ability, CSI, CSI inline volume feature gate, which I haven't enabled, so I guess we'll have to see. I think it's actually, I think every everything I need is already like, in uh, v118 to play with this stuff so then we get into kind of the fun part like deploying a csi driver on kubernetes and this is kind of where i think we're gonna change to the content on the vault website they do highlight some of the challenges basically gotta you have to allow privileged containers Actually, I think this flag has been deprecated and removed, so it probably could be removed from this documentation. It's no longer a viable note. Enabling mount propagation. 
other, another feature that CSI depends on is mount propagation. It allows the share, sharing of volumes mounted by one container to other containers in the same pod or even other pods on the same node. All right, well, this will be interesting because we're actually using container D. See the mount propagation docs to enable this feature for your cluster. We will see if this works for us. So now to get into the fun part where we hack on some things, we are going to use this content to get this stuff rolling. So we're going to mount volumes, we're going to mount vault secrets through container storage interface in a CSI volume. So we're going to see how far down the path we can get on this one. Does that all sound good to everybody? Everybody jazzed about that? Yeah, I didn't think so. How does the attempt? We are going to actually look at that, Suresh. So like when we create this one, we're going to we're going to play with like how that works. Yeah, Rook and Seth are pretty amazing. I'm a, I've been playing with Rook and Seth since like OpenStack days. And I remember like being, uh, you know, savagely burned by CephFS back in the day. Unfortunately, I don't. Uh, fortunately, I haven't actually explored that since. And it's something that we definitely have. Uh, there's definitely a lot of interest in. So, cool. So, we're going to walk through this, which is the documentation hosted on HashiCorp Learn. Um, in which we're going to use the uh, the CSI volume to mount a pod. So we're just going to walk through this process. We're going to see how far we can get with it. And if we can get all the way through the whole thing, then we're also going to compare kind of that existing volume model with our default storage class and the secret and see how these things are different because we're leveraging C. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was good times. All right, so let's move forward here. We're going to see what the difference between those two mounts are. So we already got Cube Kettle. We already got Helm. We got our cluster up and running. I believe this will be our next step. So we're going to use the Vault Helm chart. One of the things I noticed about this, which is actually pretty cool, is that they uh, require Helm 3. So they're not even providing a Helm chart if you don't have Helm 3, which is actually kind of neat. Vault manages secrets that are written to these mountable volumes. To provide these secrets, a single vault server is required. For this demonstration, vault can be run in development mode to automatic to automatically handle initialization, unsealing, and setup of the Kubernetes or the uh, the key volume or key value secrets engine. Boop. Okay. Server dev enabled true, injector enabled false. Here we go. All right, so we got it deployed. I like actually, um, one of the interesting things about the way that they've done this documentation is that they've actually used the, the uh, capability of Helm 3 in which you can point to a tarball that represents that chart rather than actually interacting with it as like in a chart museum piece, right? So um, although I do have Let's see, Helm repo lists. I do have HashiCorp's uh, Helm chart in my repo set. Um, I'm not actually pulling it from that. I'm pulling it directly from this piece. And the neat thing about that is that in your documentation, right, you can be really explicit about what the configuration is because you're going to be pulling a very explicit archive of that Helm chart. You're not have, you don't have to worry. We don't have to worry so much about whether the Helm chart has moved forward in time. And so the and so the documentation has changed, and that's actually kind of neat. I think that's true. The older versions can support it, but I do like that. I do like that. Um, it, I perceive that there is a push toward supporting only Helm three for for particular um, Helm charts, which is actually pretty cool. Yeah. So let's do our get pods. See if we got that going. Cube kettle get pods. We got vault zero running. Let's go ahead and set a secret in vault. Hey, look, we're not running. We're running as a user. That's cool. It's a pretty good secure thing.
If you're interested in learning more about Vault, definitely check out this website. Um, they do a really decent job of actually providing a lot of really great documentation to explore how all of the primitives within Vault work. The object of this episode is to kind of explore not so much the Vault piece, but also but get into like how that CSI piece is working with secrets and that kind of stuff. And so I'm kind of shooting through uh, the Vault piece here because I'm uh, the focus of this is not, uh, in my opinion, the focus of this is not Vault. So we got the secret created. We can view it. We need to turn on the vault auth in Kubernetes. And so this is actually basically enabling vault to use service accounts as authentication tokens to access secrets, uh, which is pretty cool. So this actually just turned it on. We haven't configured it yet. So let's go ahead and configure it. Oh, neat. Okay, so there's actually a whole bunch of assumptions in this line. We should talk about it because I think it's going to be neat. All right. That is really cool. I like I like how they did that, but let's talk about it. So remember that right now I am exec into a pod and the deployment of that pod was handled by the helm chart, not by me. Because of that, they can make a bunch of different assumptions about how things are going to be configured, right? They can make the assumption that I have a, that there is a, 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 a service account token associated with this pod that has the appropriate permissions to authenticate uh, via the um, token authenticator piece inside of Kubernetes. And we'll look at that here in a second. But that's actually built into the, that's an assumption that they make, right? So if I look at that particular path, var run secrets Kubernetes IDIO service account token, that's going to be the token that is associated with the service account that this pod is operating on. And we can look at that here in just a moment as well. Um, and then the Kubernetes host, we're just going to use the internal uh, Kubernetes port 443 TCP adder, which is actually, in most cases, it's going to be your service cider plus one. So in, in my case, I think it's 10.96.01, but we'll look at it in here in a second. And then the Kubernetes CA cert is also a part of the mechanism that it gets mounted when you join, when you uh, uh, create a service account. So a service account actually puts in like three pieces of information, the namespace you're in, your token, and a CA certificate, uh, and it mounts it to every pod inside of your system by default. So we saw the configuration happen, and if we look at that token ourselves, var run secrets, kubernetes.io service account, So those are those three things that are mounted in that I'm talking about before. We have our CA cert, our namespace, and our token. And if I cat that token, oop, I didn't CD into it. Var run secrets. That's the, that, this is a, um, a JWT or a, jo, uh, a JWT token for uh, accessing the Kubernetes API and to constrain the permissions of this particular token, we have to understand what the permissions are of that particular service account. So I might show that real quick if there's some interest in it. Let me know if that's, what is the at symbol for? Where do you see the at, at symbol? Oh, I see. Right here, yes. Yeah. Missed it, yep, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is basically just telling it that this is the uh, this is the so the content the, Kube, the Kubernetes CA certificate. The content is actually in inside of this particular location, um, and I believe that that's a function of the Vault CLI command. Uh, it's a way that you can actually pass to it uh, content from a file. Uh, some different things do it different ways, like you know file colon slash 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 is another way to do it. Um, but basically, it's just telling it the content of this particular um, field can be found at this file at this particular path. Does that make sense? All right. So we talked through that part of it. Let's go back to our doc. 
we got that part done. The token reviewer JWT and Kubernetes CA certificate reference files written. To, hey, they even document like what these things are. That's awesome. And then for the Kubernetes secret store CSI driver to read secrets requires that it has read permission of all mounts and access to the secret itself. So this is going to allow us, actually, hold on. This is going to uh, configure what happens. It's going to configure the authorization part as it relates to that token that we saw being uh, used here. So, you'll note that we're only giving read access, and that means that as that um, as a system, as the entity that has access to this, we will only be able to read the secret, not modify it, which will be cool. So we've uploaded the policy for internal app. So as somebody who, who reference, references internal app as their role, this would only, um, this would only allow read access. Sorry about jumping around a little bit. So currently vault extension of the Kubernetes secret store only supports the KV secrets engine. This Extension verifies that the secret, the requested secret belongs to a supported engine by reading the mounted secrets engine and the data of the KVV2 secret requires that the after, requires that, that's a typo, right, requires that after the mount, the additional path element of data is included. Finally, create a Kubernetes authentication role named database that binds this policy with a Kubernetes service account named Secret Store CSI Driver. Okay, so we've created our policy. Now we're going to create a role that consumes that policy. So this policy gives me access to the secret for this da particular database that we created earlier. And then we bound that particular um, policy to a service account name, secret store CSI driver. And we've, crown and we've associated that with the um, namespace default, which is interesting. So both of these two things allow us to constrain things in such a way that, <coughs> the, um, that the service account when trying to access vault and authenticate is only authorized to access these particular secrets and it's only able and it's only able to um, read them and not able to write them. So our CSI driver, when it mounts that secret, will only be able to show it to us. It will not be able to modify it back to vault. It's a good, reasonable policy for um, least privilege. All right, we got everything turned on here. Let's go ahead and do our exit. Boop. Um, one thing I wanted to show real quick. Uh, you've seen this before. Uh, if we do kubectl get or describe pod vault zero. So this is the service account associated with it, right? And so we have a vault token, uh, we have a, um, a secret here. But what I want to do is I want to actually show the, where is it at? There should be service account. Okay. Get service. Get service account. So there's our vault service account. And then I'm going to show you this really cool command called kubectl auth can I dash dash list as system service account default vault and what this lets me see is what type of permissions this particular service account has uh, within Kubernetes so if I were to impersonate this group uh, uh, what I'm doing with the dash dash as flag here is I'm impersonating that service account 
and I'm taking a look at the permissions that it has. Um, and I'm going to make this a little smaller. I know that it, it may maybe make it a little bit harder to read, but it's not going to make it impossible. And so we can look at the permissions that it has. It has the ability to do self-subject access reviews and self-subject rules reviews and um, basically understand like what capabilities it has. It has the genera the kind of the generic discovery stuff turned on. So it can understand it, it can hit healthy and LiveZ and open API and information about the API server. Um, and this is actually the one role that we're actually allowing it, which is a little bit different, which is allowing it token review access, right? So if somebody gives this vault token a token to review, so like our application when it tries, or when the CSI driver tries to authenticate to vault to get that secret, how vault can determine that that is a trusted service account or a trusted token is by going through that token review process. And so this API is actually expressed by Kubernetes. It gives it that ability to say, okay, I have somebody, has re I have received a token. Is this a viable token? Kubernetes API server will say yes or no. If it says yes, then we've passed authentication. And then a question, then the question becomes, what can this authenticated, um, what can this uh, authenticated token do? And that's where we get into the policy part, right? So that gives us the authorization piece to go with authentication. Once a token is authorized or once a token is authenticated via this token review process, then we can look at it and say, okay, well, within Vault, within Vault's RBAC system, that authenticated token has the ability to read the, these particular secrets and this particular content. I said this wasn't about Vault, but you know how it is. We're going to get into it anyway. Let's go ahead and grab this guy. Let's do our checkout of the secret store uh, CSI driver. Now, again, I started this episode by um, talking about the fact that these things are um, that the, the secret store CSI driver is upstream inside of uh, the Kubernetes project, right? This isn't a specific to Vault. Dang it. Sorry about the dog. There's no way for me to quiet him down. Um, but because of the checkout, right? Like you can understand that this is upstream code. This is not code that is part of Vault. This is Vault is just an implementation of the CSI piece, right? So important note. Actually, there's actually, I mean, there's a minor net here. Uh, this probably should be instead of being this particular URL, this should probably be .k8.io. Um, you probably should go with the actual short name for this stuff because likely if there's any libraries or any, anything else inside of here, it's going to use that path. It's not going to use GitHub to do it. So one other, one other side note, just clean things up. Okay, and then we're going to move into the secret store driver. And then we've got it checked out. We're going to use Helm to install this. Helm install CSI, secret store driver, and that's where the chart. Oh, I've already moved into the directory though. So, make sure that works. Yep. Okay. So, we're going to install the Helm chart that's sitting in this directory. Let's we'll go ahead and kick it off. And then we'll also look inside of what's happening there, right? So, Charts, secrets, Helm template. So this is the chart that's actually going to deploy um, our CSI storage stuff. And we can see that there are a few things that are happening, right? We're defining a, a that we're defining that service account that we talked about earlier. We're putting it in the default namespace. So this is the name of the service account that will be used to authenticate to Vault to go get secrets. 
we are defining a custom resource definition. So there'll be actual CRDs that are registered with our cluster. We'll look at them here in a minute as well. It looks like they're using Cube Builder to define this. So you have a secret provider class, kind being defined, and it uses the open API v3 schema stuff. So we can actually be pretty confident that the fields that are necessary will be populated. And if they aren't populated, that it will not allow the creation of that CRD object. We talked a little bit about that part of it in CRDs before in a previous episode, but yeah, having an open API spec is actually pretty cool. It also gives us the ability to do things like, uh, so here's the API resources. We can see all of the CRDs that are being created. So here's our secret provider classes that were part of that CRD. But then as of, I think it's like 116 or 117, you can now do explain. And this doesn't have it in there, but you can see that I actually got a result, right? So if the description is actually populated as well, you'll be able to see explain populated by a CRD now, which is so cool. Anyway, let's see if CSI knows is in there. CSI knows. Yes. Okay. So storage.k8.io, um, <coughs> we can actually see uh, kubectl explain content for what a CSI node is, right? We can see kubectl explain content for a lot of these things. And it really gives it mean, it means as a platform operator, you have one place to go and look at the definition of what those, of what those APIs mean and how they can be used. Um, pretty darn cool stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, cert fun. I am a sucker for cert fun. All right, so let's move on here. Let's see if we get our pods. I suspect we will. So we have our CSI store driver running. Notice that there's two of them. So let's do a show wide. And we can see that the reason there are two of them is because there's one running on each worker, right? Uh, so this CSI driver piece is actually, I believe this is a get DS. This is a daemon set that's been deployed by that Helm chart that we were looking at earlier. In fact, if we go back to our Helm chart, our Helm template, this is the daemon set that's being defined. It's consuming that um, service account that's been created. And inside of here, we have the node driver registrar. We actually have a number of containers. And if we go back to the documentation on the CSI side of things, we can see why these containers exist but they're responsible for how the implementation happens. Notice that we've installed Vault and that's all fine and well, but what we're talking about here is actually just installing the, the pieces that are necessary to expose that container storage interface. We haven't associated that any, anything that provides for that storage uh, interface yet. We've only just installed the, um, the storage interface itself, right? So we're still missing the part where we say, hey, storage interface, hey, CSI uh, storage interface, here is a provider for you, right? And we can actually even see where those things would be, would show up, right? We have a plugin directory mounted at slash CSI. We have a registration directory mounted at slash registration. And if we, get down, if we go down, we can see the volume mounts that are associated with that. The volume mount, um, looks like uh, that's actually for that container volumes here we go so the volumes that are actually being expressed here are coming from the host so these are host path mounts right and that means that the um, the registry the plugin registry and the plug and there's actually uh, the register the plugin for CSI secret store and the host path for the providers directory. And so if you're going to register, if we're going to register vaults to the container storage interface, we need to basically register it by associating ourselves with content inside of these directories on the underlying host. Interesting stuff. We're going to play with that a little bit more before we get too much farther. We also have, what is this guy? This is actually one of the storage objects, a CSI driver. Uh, defining that particular storage object, the, sto the secret store storage object. So, cool. 
Volume life cycle modes are ephemeral. Attach required false. Pot info on mount true. This is basically a, a defining the driver for secrets. But we, again, it's not specifically calling out that that driver will be satisfied by vault. It's just calling out that particular driver. All right. Back to our docs. We got, we got that applied. Now, apply the provider vault executable and secret provider class resource. This is where we connect them, right? This is where we connect that, that container storage interface with a provider that will allow uh, that will allow us to consume secrets. Right now, what we've got so far, we've got container storage interface, we've got a vault implementation running, but we haven't actually glued them together, and this is where that's going to happen. So let's take a look at what's happening here. We're going to define another daemon set, and we're going to call it provider vault. <coughs> we are going to put, that means that we're going to put a pod on every node in the cluster that's running Linux. Um, and we're going to uh, go ahead and put in our provider vault installer. It's interesting because of the name, I wonder if we can actually delete it afterwards. But <clears throat> if we look at the volumes that are being that are being passed to this installer, we can see that we're actually using a path. We're mounting a path up that's called Etsy Kubernetes Secret Store CSI Providers. And if we go back to our content over here, right? Etsy Kubernetes Secret Store CSI Providers. Right? So this is actually how we're going to be registering this particular plugin. We're going to be registering it as a provider at that path on the underlying host. So let's go ahead and do that part. Boop. Copy and paste. So we see that that got created. And if we do kubectl get ds for daemon set, we can see that up to date and available, all things are working. There's our provider for vault being applied. And if we jump into one of our nodes, Kind worker bash the Etsy Kubernetes secret store providers. There is Vault, and this is being implemented and this is being installed by that um, CSI provider store provider Vault. This is actually putting content there, and then the other daemon set, the actual driver, is consuming the content from there. And so if we look at the log, we'll probably be able to see how that provider became a registered thing. And this is actually just using a go binary file provider vault um, type provider vault. Oh, you know, kind is pretty stripped down anyway. So um, but this is a go binary that's present on the that is now made available on the disk. Let's do kubectl logs. And I want to see what we're going to see in the logs of the store driver. Oop, eight. Node driver registrar. So it's connecting to this uh, container storage interface, or it's defining the container storage so uh, socket interface or connecting to it. Get plugin info, secret store driver is a plugin. Registration socket has been applied. Uh, interestingly, I don't see it registering yet. I wonder if that's actually expected or not. It does not cache the resource as pod restart will result in a different path on the host. Yeah, that would have worked. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, read his thing. CSI provider, one time dependency. What's happening here? Okay. Is it a better idea to set... Where are you headed with that, Mavinder?
Oh, did I miss that? Received notify registration call. I was actually looking for something to say vault in there, but maybe that's just not going to happen. Oh, no problem, Avender. I was like, why would you do that with a daemon set? But I guess it'll make sense. Can anyone recommend a circle CI to share? I'm not going to get into that. That's in the chat. All right, here we go. So we got that far. The install has worked. We see it running. We see our three containers there. Let's do this piece here. Ah, cool. That's here I am actually doing. <laughs> I was looking at the file from the um, nodes perspective, but we're going to just jump right into the provider. So we're going to jump into the the container that is actually um, consuming it and see and make sure that it can see it. That's that's a great. I love that we're kind of on the same page here. So jump in here. So what we're doing is we're executing into the CSR uh, CSI storage driver. Oh, that's probably a bug. I copied and pasted it, but it's not going to work that way, that's for sure. Stat, Etsy, Kubernetes, Secrets. And actually, yeah. Say what now? What am I missing here? Okay. Into the, yeah, that's right. That's what I was thinking too, but I wasn't sure. That's because obviously there has to be more than one container. Uh, I think it'll get, or I'll let's do CSI uh, driver, let's do store, CSI driver eight. Basically just trying to prove that it's there. Secret store container, okay. Boom, finally got it, all right. So bug in the docs, what we're doing here with this command, kubectl executing into one of our pods that is running this CSI driver we're jumping into the secret store container because the pod has multiple containers. Then we're gonna pass uh, standard output input and we're gonna run the stat command against Etsy, Kubernetes, secret store, CSI providers, vault provider, vault. Um, and basically just making sure that inside of the secret store um, uh, application process area, we can actually see that particular binary. It's mounted in and it, and it shows up which it does, so that's good. We can see it there. That's pretty cool. 
The Kubernetes Secret Store CSI Driver Helm Chart creates a definition for the, store, the secret provider class resource. And we looked at that before in the Helm Chart. The resource describes the parameters that are given to the executable. To configure it, it requ to configure it requires the IP address of the vault server and the name of the vault server, the Kubernetes authentication role and the secrets. So let's take a look at this. So we've registered it, and now we're going to try and make the the, the we're going to try and make a storage class effectively of it. Right. So let's take a look at it. So in this case, it's secret store CSI xkates.io. It's in alpha still, so alpha one. It's kind secret provider class. The metadata, for the name of this will be the vault database. The provider will be vault, which is a registered provider now. We finally just did that part. And then some of the parameters to tell it how to go and find vault. Um, the vault address will be HTTP colon slash slash. That doesn't make me happy. I guess that's because it's in dev mode. Kind of wild that that's HTTP. But anyway, so it's going to access this content unencrypted uh, against the local vault inside of my cluster. And this particular piece, if you're not already familiar with it, this is actually going to work because of service name discovery inside of Kubernetes, right? So. This, uh, the way this breaks down, it's a kind of a short name. Uh, you could actually fully qualify it if you want to and make it a little easier to understand. But what's happening here is we're actually identifying a service named vault in the default namespace. And then the rest of the implied host name would be .svc for service, .cluster.local for, um, which basically indicates that we're using service name discovery inside of Kubernetes. So the vault that vault dot default works is because of service name discovery inside of cube. And then the port that it's going to be listening on port 8200, the role name is database. This is where you can go and interact with secrets. Um, the vault skip TLS verify is true, which is interesting because we're not actually using TLS at all. It seems unless I'm missing something. And then the objects are an array. The object that we're actually going to be exposing here is that database password that we set earlier. The object name is password and the object path is slash db pass. Go ahead and hit enter. Look at kubectl describe secret provider class vault database. No events, that's okay. So we got that part. We got this verify that the storage class was has been defined and it is. So now I think we're almost ready to the fun part. We're ready to actually define our pod. I mean all of this has been fun for me, but you know, I'm I'm a glutton for this kind of thing. We're defining our pod that it's going to consume that secret. I think it'll get pods. And let's take a look at the definition of this pod. We're telling it to find, we're going to telling it to mount the secret into mount secret store inside of the pod. We're using a volume uh, named secret store inline. We can, this name is arbitrary. We can call it anything, but look at the type, the volume type. So instead of host path or rook or, you know, um, uh, even a PVC, any of those things, we're actually defining a type CSI, right? And then we're telling that volume, uh, and then via that CSI interface, we're telling it, use the driver secret store CSI kh.io, that upstream plugin that we turned on in CSI. Um, we want to mount this read-only true. I mean, it's going to be read-only no matter what, right? Because we didn't actually provide write access to this secret. We are only providing read access to the secret. The volume attributes, like telling it basically how to go and f how to, how to go and find that secret for us. So the only attribute we're going to provide is the secret provider class for Vault database, right? Now, when we defined that class up above here, 
we gave it one password. So this is the one to many situation, right? Wherein anything that accesses that particular secret provider class is gonna get this secret. We're not allowing for the dynamic creation or the dynamic relationship of that secret. We're just saying, this is the one secret. And then when anybody accesses this class, it's going to get this secret. Um, just as a reminder here, if we go back to the documentation over here, what we've done is this basic provisioning secret, right? We've said, go find that particular secret name and associate it with the store with the, with the class. Okay. Um, but we haven't enabled this functionality, which is like a, uh, to give to enable us when we're defining the actual uh, mount to give more parameters or to give us more specific information about what secret to go get. We haven't done that part. We've only done this part. All right. So we've got the secret mounted and we've got the pod created. Let's go look at this pod and play around with it a little bit and kind of compare what we saw in our previous example, right? So we've got kubectl get pods, kubectl describe, pod nginx. We've got this thing mounted. If we look at the volume, uh, the volumes that have been created, we've got the CSI volume. Let's go look at this thing on a, low, on a lower level and see what this looks like. Oh, so first we need to know where it is, which we should be able to determine from the node name. So it's on kind worker. Let's go ahead and jump into kind worker. And we can do our Sierra Kettle PS. There's our nginx process, right? We do CRI kettle inspect. So here we are looking at the uh, container definition that container D used to start this guy. And we're looking for the path that will let us understand that secret. Does it present in the same way? All right, so here we have the, the path, mount secret store. It's a bind mount, which means it is still expressed on the underlying host. But let's go ahead and see what we see here, right? So this will be kind of the fun part. So CSI secret store inline mount. kind of here that's kind of hard to see so cat db pass so that is the content inside the secret db secret password So interestingly, we're on the underlying node. We still have access to the content of the secret. It's not um, it's not directly attached to the container yet. It's still, I mean, and I don't believe that it's going to be in this particular instance. And so we still have that attack vector of if somebody can get uh, into the underlying node, they're going to be able to get access to all of those secrets. They wouldn't have to jump into the containers. Although in reality, if you have um, if you have access to the underlying host, you still have that problem. But let's look at one more thing before we. Uh, dig too much farther. What I want to show is grep secret style secret store inline. Um, 
that this oh sorry about that okay so but this this, this mount is actually mounted via tempfs right so even though it is exposed on the underlying host um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the content will be there um, it, it doesn't mean that it's persisted to disk right uh, the distinction here is that because it's not persisted to disk if somebody were to get a hold of this disk and try looking for secrets on it right like somebody gets a hold of the disk in a server or whatever like that's your attack if that's your attack vector then um, this then this would actually not help that uh, this would actually help that a lot because even if they get a hold of the disk even if you're not using whole disk encryption the secrets not pers ever never persisted to disk uh, however it is mounted via tempfs on that node so at runtime while everything's powered on and operating if you can actually exploit the underlying host in such a way that you can um, interact with the underlying file system, then you would still be able to access that secret. It is plain text, yes. But you know, I mean like understand your, this is where I'm gonna like harp a little bit on like understanding the security of things and the attack vector of things, right? So understand your attack vectors, understand your threat your threat model here, right? So in our con, uh, I think the context, the threat model, and actually it would be really interesting to see a threat model for secrets here. Um, and that is that they're, what they're trying to do is ensure that the CSI, um, actually be really interesting to see a threat model for a secret CSI driver and also for Vault. So, and I think Vault has uh, threat models, but what they're trying to do is ensure that they have um, a reasonable implementation of getting a secret into a pod without uh, exposing that secret outside of um, out to other pods within the cluster without some intent, right? So in this case, our um, let me show you kind of what I mean here. So if I do kubectl get uh, secret provider classes. So this is that provider class that we talked about before. Let's do a describe here. So in this configuration, right, um, this store, this provider class is defined within a namespace. And that means that this secret is only consumable by things within that namespace. It wouldn't be consumable by other things with, in a different namespace. It's only, it's only accessible within the namespace where that particular secret store, uh, or that, where that secret provider class has been defined. Also, we're not persisting this to etcd uh, and encrypting it with base64. With base we're using vault for that encryption. And when, on the consumption model, whenever anybody accesses this secret, right, we're going to have an event or related to the to the the the, uh, the consumption of this secret that we can track and audit. We can understand when the when that secret was um, was, was attached to a container, and we can understand what those container names are and and during what period of time that container had access to it. We have the ability to ensure that the secret is not writable. Nothing inside of the cluster has access to write that secret right now. Only somebody with access to Vault explicitly and the permission to write that secret has that capability, right? So if our threat model included being able to modify secrets, then this breaks that threat model, I mean, pretty cleanly, right? Or protects against it. Because right now, nothing has that ability to do, to, to write that secret. Um, for us to write that secret, we would have to jump back into that kind of developer mode of vault instance and modify that directly. Now, obviously, for the vault side, we set it up in development mode, which means we turned it off pretty much every security feature that there is to turn off. Um, <laughs> if you were doing this in real life, you would actually be able to constrain, you'd be able to, dis to, to distinguish those that have the ability to write secrets to vault and those that have the ability to, con to read secrets from Vault into, into different accounts, right? In our case, we're using service accounts to authenticate to Vault to get read access to those secrets, um, but we're using, but we were actually using a locally defined user, an admin user of Vault to be able to populate secrets. And this is part of that threat modeling exercise that I'm talking about. Like, how do we think about that sort of stuff? What are we protecting against? And how do we see, and, and where do we see the challenges in it? 
So I do think that this is actually pretty awesome, and I do think that uh, it provides a pretty good mechanism for interacting uh, and granting secrets in a secure way to pods. Even though it's still expressing them in the underlying node, the threat vector of being able to understand what, um, or sorry, the attack vector of the node is already pretty uh, intense, right? If you can get root on the node, then you pretty much already own the shop. Yeah, it does, yeah. Vault, the Vault Helm chart does support TLS, yep. And the Vault Helm chart also really provides a pretty good mechanism for setting up an actually secure and reasonably implemented Vault in integration. That's not what we did here. We just did like the, the dev part of it because we were showing off the CSI piece more. So that gets us all the way through it. We can see the volume attached. We can, um, uh, let's play with, let's play with stuff here real quick, right? So. Docker exec TI. Yeah, what what else can we do? That might be interesting. So we can see the secret now. The cat db pass stat. Oh, interesting. It is read write. So even though we told. Oh, wow, that's really fascinating. Let's let's see if we can let's see if we can mess with this thing a little bit. Um, Nginx bash cd. I uh, forgot. Keep kettle describe pod nginx. The mount path is somewhere in here. Where we go, mount secret store. So there is our secret again. Um, <coughs> and can we modify it, right? So could I do echo test? DB pass. No, I can't modify it from inside the pod. Oh, but I think Rita is about to catch me. All right. So then, but could I do? Dang it! <gasps> what? Oh, so we can actually, right? So <laughs> because. We've actually mounted the node, the node mount is read write. And it doesn't look like it's reconciling that. So we've actually just, we've actually just uh, hijacked the secret. Oh, first, I mean, that probably will work, but it's a pod, so I can't restart it. I'd have to, I'd have to redeploy it. Um, <coughs> it's a good point though. So because of that, uh, it's not going to actually refresh that secret. We've basically just kind of broken the, the security model here by overriding the content from the node's perspective. So that gives us the ability to uh, mess with um, the content that's actually mounted on the underlying node. Yeah, it only, it only caches it when the pod, when it actually only caches it on mount, it looks like. All right, it's not changing. What happens if we restart? You know, this is a it's great. I love this idea. This is the this is the stuff that I think is absolutely fascinating, right? We're coming up with different theories. So let's do keep kettle get pods dash o wide, and we can see that the vault driver for worker is running here. What happens if we deleted that? What do y'all think would happen? Cube kettle delete pod. Restart will update it. Will it re what, what will it update? Will it update the content on disk? Bum, 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 bum. So what I've done is I've just restarted the the actual secret store driver on the underlying uh, on that on that particular node. I've left my can I left my pod running. Cube kettle get pods. 
dash o wide. We're back up and running. It didn't overwrite it. So it seems like the only, this is actually going to be a pretty interesting event, attack vector because, I mean, obviously if you can under if you can write to the underlying node, you have all kinds of crazy powers. It's not just this, but this is kind of an interesting way of being a little more insidious about your attack. So depending on what you're actually trying to do, that might be kind of an interesting attack vector. Um, so let's do. What I want to do is I want to turn the pod into a deployment. Actually, can I just turn it into a restartable pod? Keep kettle, edit, pod. Slip to a new line. I don't think I can do this, but I'm going to try. Oh, it's already restart policy always. Okay, so if I jump in and I do kill one uptime keep get all get pods so we just saw it restart see the restart so now if we jump back into our pod again and we do cat mount secret store db pass oh it doesn't it doesn't change it Nah, probably not. Keep it invokes the driver for. I know, right? <laughs> Persistent attacks. It's fascinating. All right. So, how can we. What thing can we modify? What can we, re, what can we change that will cause this to be updated, if anything? Hmm. Now, the reason the restart didn't work is because it's still scheduled on the same node, right? So all the volumes all still just reattach. Um, what we could do, let's do this. Zek ti kind worker bash ci kettle ps. Actually, ci kettle pod. I'm gonna just I'm gonna nuke the pod. And see if that changes anything in our world, right? So here is Nginx secret store in line. CI kettle RMP dash F. Okay, so what I've just done is I've gone to the underlying implementation in container D and I've just deleted that pod. That pod is dead, and it's gone, it's forever in the in the past. It's on the rearview mirror. And that means that any resources that were associated with that pod should also have gone away. Let's take a look. Kubectl get pods. We're back up and running. You notice that the restart value is not there anymore? That's because this is a brand new one. It's gone now. Or it was gone. It has, it has been removed. Kubectl exec ti. Nginx secret store in line. Bash. CD mount, secret store, drum roll please, cat, D pass, what do y'all think is going to happen? Oh, it didn't, how persistent is that, wow, that is fascinating, I want to understand that better, and I think you do too. Why did that not work? CI kettle inspect PS. Inspect. So here is the path. So here is the pod UUID. Does that change? Okay. So we need that content. So now we're going to do CRI kettle pods. C 
E9A121, so CRI Kettle RMP minus F. Totally gone. Brand new one, three seconds, E7, F7. CRI Kettle PS. New pod, new container. Here I cut all inspect grip secret. E five E and E five E. Wow. That is really interesting. This must be something happening inside of the CSI driver where it must be doing some kind of check to determine that there is already a volume. I bet you if we rescheduled this pod, it would change it. Look above. I'm looking above. All right. New pod ID. This shouldn't happen. It's a bug. Yes, you are. Kubernetes issue 70505. Woohoo! <laughs> if the UID is the same, then Kubelet won't invoke them out. Thank you, Anish. That's awesome. I love that I love that y'all are like online for this one. That's a fa that's a fascinating thing. But I agree this totally is a bug. But the UID is Oh, I see. Oh, I see. So even on a restart of a pod, it's not invoking the mount, which means that you're not getting a new you're not getting that secret retread. So what if I actually delete the pod? Cube kettle, delete pod, mm, Nginx secret store inline. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna cordon a kind of worker too, so it actually has to come back to this one. So cube kettle, cordon, kind worker two. And then I'm gonna jump back into the kind worker and see if we see anything, so mounts, Prep secret. We no longer have that mount. That mount is now gone, right? So we're no longer seeing that because the pod has been deleted. Um, so the only things we still see mounted in are like the, the actual um, uh, service account token for vault and for other things that are like mounted inside of this host. But that pod has been deleted. It's no longer present on there. And so now if we redefine the pod, let's see, what that would probably be up here, right? So history, grep, uh, cube kettle, apply. Nope, history. There we go, 2076. What did I miss there? Yup, make it so. That was weird. Okay, so our pod's been defined again. Cube kettle get pods. Jump in again. See down here, you could all, uh, see I can actually mount pipe grep secret. So that's our mount.
So if we do Sierra Kettle Inspect, actually Sierra Kettle PS. Sierra Kettle Inspect. We pop on up to our mount here. And we're back to the secret. I did delete the pod. I completely deleted the pod and the container. The pod and the container were completely deleted. But the bug that was highlighted that, Ash that Anish is pointing out is a different bug. Um, because, like, or unless, unless maybe it's a different bug than you think it is. So, to just to kind of really highlight this, if I do CR Kettle Pods, we can see that the pod ID is D0BED3732FF4, right? And if I do Sierra Kettle RMP, remove pod, dash F of that, then I get a brand new pod ID. Brand new pod ID. If I do cube kettle describe pod Nginx, We have a different problem. Maybe. D zero. B twelve C. Oh, that's a container ID. Sorry, my bad. So, do we see the container ID? See, do we see the container ID change? So, cube kettle, uh, Docker exec ti kind worker, Sierra kettle, ps, e2fc. So, we definitely saw the container ID change, but we don't seem to be. What I don't be able to, what I don't seem to be able to determine, is whether we see the pod ID change from Kubernetes' perspective. Keep kettle get pod nginx dash o y or yaml. So this is probably the UUID that's being used here. Move this back down. What I'm trying to determine is like where we're driving the path, right? So there is the UUID of the pod. And Docker exec ti kind worker bash mount grip. Actually, I should already have it. CR kettle ps. Here's the Nginx pod. Sierra Kettle inspect. So we can see this is the pod ID known about inside of etcd for this pod. And even though we restarted it and we deleted the underlying pod container, we haven't generated an event that would allow for etcd to delete this object and make a new one. And so because of the mount, this is actually really interesting, because of the way this uh, URL, this uh, path has been defined, um, as long as the pod ID doesn't change, the content of that secret won't be remounted. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Fascinating. I hope you all learned something. I learned something today. And I love that. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in. That was what I wanted to show you.
the pod sandbox still should remain the same if the container is killed. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. So container D has the idea of pods. Container D has the idea of sandboxes, uh, of, of containers, right? But these don't line up 100% with the uh, UUID inside of the, inside of the, um, inside of etcd. So again, like, just to really make that super clear, clear. And that was, I think, part of the disconnect for me was kind of interesting. Uh, there it is. Okay. Making that a little bigger. So, clear, td, clear, kubekit, I'll get pods, nginx, grep, dash ir, or begins with uid. Oh. oh, YAML. All right. So there's the UID of the pod. All right. And now if I jump into the container and I blow that thing away, it's like gone, gone forever. Cube kettle. Uh, say Docker exec. Kind worker. Bash. Sierra Kettle pods, which shows me the sandbox and the containers, right? So I'd be able to, like, basically from the perspective of container D, the pods container is the sandbox, right? So I'm going to chuck this one. Sierra Kettle RMP minus F. Remove everything associated with this pod or this sandbox. Make it completely go away. It is gone. Totally gone, and all of the containers along with it. If I do a refresh up here, I see that that value hasn't changed. If I do a uh, refresh down here, I see that it has changed. So this is kind of a naming collision. Really what's happening is I've described the pod, uh, container D thinks of these, the pod as a pods container. And, um, and that's why you don't see pods containers in container D. If I do Sierra Kettle PS, show me all the containers, I'm not going to see pause containers. And that's because the pause container is more representative of the pod container in container D. I hope that makes a little bit more sense, but that's actually part of the disconnect that I was having. Was if I chuck the pause container, would I also get a new pod? The answer is no. So cool. Yeah, that's what I wanted to show you. I, I hope that was educational. I hope people dug it. I thought it was fascinating. We found a really interesting exploit. Um, yeah. Let me kick back to face here so I can see how y'all are doing. Uh, face. Okay. Cool. I hope that that was awesome. I enjoyed it very much. It's a, it's a you know, I love playing with all of this stuff and kind of digging into it and seeing how it's all wired up underneath. Um, I thought, I hope you thought that was a good time. If the pod was a deployment, then the UID would change. Yes, that's right. Um, if we made it a deployment, then, but only if, actually, I mean, let me be really clear. Mavinder, the UID for the pod would only change if that pod object was deleted, right? If we have a deployment, I would have to actually delete that pod to have a new pod created with a new ID for, for, the, for the new mount to work. In fact, do you want to explore that stuff with me real quick? Or do you or, or are you ready to call it a day? Everybody ready to call it a day or do you want to look at that other thing? Last chance before I call it a day. You are in and that is good enough for me. All right. I'm totally a sucker for this stuff. I don't know why. It's just like my thing. Okay. So let's do look at let's look at our pod again. I'm going to convert this into a deployment. Boop, 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 boop.
14. Okay. I got everything lined up. Controller. Not a pod though, it's a deployment. Okay, so we got kind. Uh, no, we don't. Mm, ding. Okay, so we got API version apps v1 is a kind deployment. Metadata is name is nginx secret store inline. The namespace is default. We've given it some labels. Inside of the spec, we have one replica. We're matching the labels secrets, apps equals secrets. Inside of the template, we're setting that label. So that's a good thing. Inside of our spec, we are defining a single container. It is the Nginx container. It's named Nginx. That's the volume. That's the volume, vo that's the volume mount class. Looks good to me. Cube kettle, actually move pod.yaml to deployment.yaml. Cube kettle, delete pod. Nginx. And then kubectl apply dash f deployment. Missed it somewhere. Somebody see it? Unknown field secret provider class. Probably one more tab. There we go. There we go. Cool. Now we got cute kettle get pods. There's our one pod running. It is going to be running on kind worker. Cube kettle. So dash o wide. So then this particular pod is running on kind worker, and it's only the it's the only one. Okay, so then we are going to retry our experiment. But this time, instead of deleting it at the node level, we're going to delete it at the, at the, uh, at the top inside of kubectl. So kubectl exec ti kind worker, or sorry, no, sorry, docker kind worker bash. And then we are going to Sierra kettle inspect uh, PS. Let's take a look at that running container. Sierra Kettle inspect the pod. Look for the secret. Well, secret store. There's our pass. That happen. GSI mount echo dang it into db pass cat db pass good okay and then we can show down here cube kettle exec ti nginx bash cat mount secret store See the override still happening. Now if we do a kubectl delete of that pod. Actually, before we do that, let's do this, right? So this is the UUID of the pod on disk, 74E7. So that's the UUID of the pod inside of etcd as stored, right? So now if we go ahead and delete that pod, delete pod, 
into next secret store we will get a new pod created and that and that's happening on the same node that we saw before so then pods been deleted keep got to get pods you see that one being terminated or whatever I wonder what's holding up the termination. It's really taking a minute. But we can already jump into the new one, so let's do that. Exec TI Nginx Secrets BSGF Bash CD Mount Secret Store Cat DB Pass. And it's the correct pass. I am actually really curious why the mount's not working though. Oh, it's probably because. <laughs> you know why the deletion's failing right now? Does anybody have a guess? Does anybody see the problem? Like why I can't delete the old pod? Fascinating. You're in the folder. Yes. it doesn't complain about it there. Yeah, exactly. I was in the folder when I tried to delete it. And so because of that, um, that you can't delete that path. Kubelet won't delete that path. Now let's see if it, let's see if it self heals before we go. Kubectl delete pod nginx Yeah. So the, I had to make another delete call probably, but yeah. It has nothing to do with the node, node being cordoned. It had to, fa had to do with the fact that I was actually inside the folder. You nailed it. First shot. That was awesome. All right. Now that really is it. Um, uh, yeah. So I hope that was educational. I hope you got something out of it. I know I did. I know I really enjoyed hanging out with y'all on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Um, so again, yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much for tuning in and I will see you next time or somebody else will. Um, looks like we're actually pulling more people into doing some TGIK, so that'll be super exciting. I really hope that happens soon um, it's because it's great to have more viewpoints. You know what I mean? Like for me, TGIK is about perspective. It's about me bringing my perspective to a problem and, and you asking me questions. And I think it's, it's great to have that from a bunch of different hosts. So. Thanks so much. I had a great time. I'll see you next time. And I agree. Debugging live like this stuff is, is the best. It, it totally is the best. So thanks a bunch. I'll see you next time. Let me...